Lufthansa has been very uh, vague on the routes they are flying with the Dream Collection, so time will tell. So, welcome to the second video of the channel, where I finally get to take that Lufthansa flight that I missed out on previously. The trip, which is expected to take 12 hours, is set to be the reddest of red-eye flights that I've ever taken. LH797 departs from Hong Kong at 11.45 in the evening, with the flight taking us up through mainland China, before banking right through Mongolia, into central Russia, and passing through Belarus and Poland, before entering German airspace and arriving at 5.45 in the morning at Frankfurt's main airport. Today, I start my trip in Hong Kong, one of the two special administrative regions of China, which in the last few years has been thrown into the spotlight for all the wrong reasons. But for me, Hong Kong is a uniquely impressive city in its own right, with the hustle and bustle making it exceptionally vibrant, dynamic, and incredibly fast paced. At night, the orange street lights light up the night sky, a sign that the city is always on the move. But today, our journey starts at Hong Kong International Airport, or more specifically Lantau Island, where Hong Kong's airport is located. The airport is pretty well laid out, with the heart of the passenger terminal unsurprisingly called Terminal 1. Terminal 2, which is just next door, doesn't actually handle flights, rather it handles check-ins and spits people out airside into Terminal 1. Additionally, for departures, there's a northern satellite as well as a midfield concourse. And to make people's lives easier, the airport is connected by a mini transit system which runs the length of the terminal. Now, Hong Kong Airport is a bit unique in that the airport has an integrated ferry terminal which is connected by the passenger mover and allows for cross-border journeys to happen to places like, say, Macau and Shenzhen. If you land in Hong Kong, because the transfer happens airside, the benefit of this means that you don't need to clear immigration or customs in Hong Kong before your onward ferry journey. But if you are visiting Hong Kong, getting to town is actually quite convenient with the Airport Express. And once you're in town, you can pretty much go anywhere you want with the mass transit system. And I'm not sponsored by Hong Kong's tourism board, I'm only saying this because out of the cost of the Airport Express ticket, on your return journey, you have access to in-town check-ins, which is so beneficial. Back inside the terminal, as you'll no doubtedly see, I'm departing from what is a very empty airport. Like you know it's bad for an airport when the McDonald's has to close. However, as an airline, I guess you could say everyone had a premium check-in experience. Going airside though was pretty simple. I was the only one at security and clearing immigration was literally a three minute endeavor. In hindsight, I don't even know why I went through the airport so quickly. Landside was definitely an indicator what the airside experience was gonna be like. But I thought, hey, capitalism would have prevailed and the duty free would have been open, but I guess not. So I did what any self-respecting travel YouTuber would have done and I went to find an open lounge. I mean, there's only so many public service announcements that you can listen to before you start losing it. Avian influenza or Ebola virus disease such as fever, cold, shortness of breath, diarrhea, vomiting, rash or bleeding. Please approach port health personnel at boundary control point for assistance. With all the Star Alliance lounges closed, in the end, I found one open lounger which wasn't operated by Cathay Pacific, which thankfully was operated by one of the best independent lounge companies in the world, in my opinion. In fact, unless you're traveling from an airline's hub, very few lounges can surpass the quality of a plaza premium. You may actually have a better experience with an economy class ticket and a priority pass to gain access, and emphasis on the priority pass, as plaza premium charged by the hour, and a two hour stint can cost you an eye-watering 75 US dollars and I thought hotel Wi-Fi charges were criminal. So one visit less on my priority pass account, and at this point I don't know why I'm still surprised no one was here. I guess you could say I was spot for choice where to sit. When I was there though, I stayed clear of the booze and only had a quick bite or two, because when flying long haul, the value really isn't in the food and drink, rather it's the shower. The fact you can refresh yourself before a flight is quintessentially the best part of any lounge experience. With the lounge out of the way, and knowing I was never going to see an airport this empty again, I had about 40 minutes left before departure, so I slowly drifted past the row of closed shops, taking it easy, and no one was here at the gate. It turned out that because there were so few people on this flight, they basically started boarding at the very last minute. Anyway, this is probably a good time to run through the trip. Today's flight will be operated by an Airbus A340-300, a first gen A340. The plane I'm on today is still painted in the old livery, and had its first flight back in June 2000. Just let that sink in for a moment. This is a 20 year old aircraft. If this plane was in Emirates' fleet, it would have been scrapped by now. 
That said, the plane uses Lufthansa's A340 Config 1, which has 30 business class seats in the front, which unfortunately isn't the new business class product Lufthansa has, which was supposed to have launched last year. Oh, hello. Hello, welcome uh, on board. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's for you. Yes, 1A. No, Thank you? you very welcome much. On. Thank you. Oh, wow, there's no one. <laughs> <laughs> So out of the 30 seats available in business, there was a total of five people in the cabin and we all sat in the first two rows. It was like COVID never existed. That aside, anyone who knows Lufthansa knows their business class on their entire long haul fleet is configured in a triple two configuration, which as a solo traveler isn't appealing at all. However, there's no way to get around it. Now, I thought this was gonna be a simple seat review. I mean, I had done one already, so how hard can the second one be? Well, while the seat itself on a fundamental level, the seat fabric, the recline, the screen panel are all the same, the thing is, between the seats there are micro differences. Like with the window seat and the aisle seat having slightly different seat layouts, with the screen and center console being the only thing that's mirrored. Take a look at the seat on the left which has a literature pocket, while the one on the right does not. What's more, due to the lack of a bassinet in the middle seats in the first row, the screen is in fact further from the passenger than any other seat in the cabin. See how the seats on the left with a bassinet brings the screens forward a good 30-40 cm compared to the R seats without it. Then there's the center console which is a different size whether you're sat in the sides or in the middle, which may impede your ability to get out over your neighbor. Finally, the screens on the first row can rotate slightly, while the screens in rows 2 and 5 can only shift left or right. Thanks Lufthansa. That said, when you look up close, these seats are really dated. In fact, the IFE screen is so dated even Lufthansa won't show it on their website, opting to use a picture of the Premium Economy IFE instead. Above that you'll find a coat hook as well as a glasses holder which you don't really see. Looking up you have really dated light randles, and on your seat you'll find the bedding which will be there when you board. Now this isn't on every long haul flight, what you're currently seeing is what Lufthansa calls the Dream Collection, which comprises of a topper, a blanket, a pillow and a sleeper top. It's part of a service upgrade that was launched in 2018 and can typically be found on flights longer than 10 and a half hours. On the underside of the armrest, both seats have USB charging, but it was a bit hidden under the console. I nearly missed it had it not been for my phone falling in the alcove. In the center console though, you have a tiny remote as well as a heavy tray table. By the floor, you'll find two universal chargers. And if you have one, the literature pocket is easily accessible and each seat has a small reading light that comes with it. Furthermore, the armrest is nothing special if nothing else is a bit stiff. And finally, on the window side, the empty void houses the location of the headphones. But the headphone jack is frankly in a stupid location. The cable is locked in with screws, and if you unplug the pin from the jack, then it's a real mission to get it back in, since you can't really see what you're doing. Anyway, as it's time to take off, I dumped everything to the seat next to me as it was free, and you really get a sense of how much space the bedding actually takes up. So, as we climb, let's take a look at the menu. As always, feel free to pause the video if you want a more in-depth look through it. For the wines, Lufthansa offers a single champagne accompanied by three reds and three whites. I must admit, I'm not a massive wine drinker, so I reviewed what other critics have said about it and aggregated the score to get an overall sum of 88 out of 100, which I hear is actually quite good. In terms of choice, as you can see, Lufthansa is tied at top with British Airways, but note how they don't offer a dessert wine. Other drinks on offer are pretty standard, except I feel they put in a bit of advertising into the beers, like the world's most popular wheat beer. Now, onto the food. For the first course, you have a choice of three starters, mains and desserts. It looks like Lufthansa is leaned towards more Asian influences with a Chinese inspired starter and a main. However, being a German carrier, I would have liked to have seen some more overt German influences. Breakfast is pretty lackluster, with a pretty simple breakfast choice. In terms of choice, Lufthansa plays the main course pretty safe, offering three choices in all three categories. So, let's get into it. Getting the table out is relatively simple. It does say push here after all. The difficulty is, is getting it out because it does weigh a ton. When examining the table, I would have liked to have seen a cup holder in the back. I travel economy quite a bit, so it's so strange not seeing it, but it's a very minor point. Although it is a very functional table, I must say. It goes back and forward and rotates a full 90 degrees to let you out. 
So, onto the meal service. To start, I had a glass of champagne spezzi. I really hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's not really on the menu, but it is effectively a mix of Coke and Fanta. If that triggers you, remember the drink is German and I'm on a German airline. The walnuts were the weakest part of the service, and for me lacked any flavour and texture, and was by my seat up until the point of landing. For starters, I had the scallop. Everything was okay, but I didn't get what that piece of bread was about on the side. It just sat there and when compared to the German loaf next to it, made it look like they ran out of bread. For the mains, it was the salmon, but again, very forgettable. But what did really stand out for me was the dessert, and I can still remember the taste of the cherries when I look back at the photo. I must admit though, portion sizes were quite large, and having done the three courses, cabin crew came around and asked if I still wanted the cheese board. I politely declined on the account that probably wouldn't have fit in the seat anymore. With the meal service out of the way, I went to get changed in the reserved for business toilet. Was there anything special? As you can see, no. It was pretty standard, the only thing different from stock was the soap dispenser I think. What's funny though is that including the toilet paper, you have three choices of paper in this bathroom, which is more choice than economy passengers have towards mains. But otherwise it was in pretty good condition for its age, and the only thing I could spot was this peel. Anyway, by the powers of video editing, I've changed into the nightshirt. As you can see, it's not 100% cotton, and while some people on Fly Talk say that it makes you itch at night, I fortunately didn't have this issue, but I found that everything I touched gave me a static shock. When I got back to my seat, I decided this was a good time to look at the amenity kit. The bag unsurprisingly opens up with yet more branding to remind you that you're in a business class seat. The kit comes with three mini packets inside, a Ziploc bag for your toothbrush, this mini packet from Lusitan, and this bag of things which comes in a pretty bow. Going through them individually, starting with Lusitan, you get this comfort cream and lip balm which is pretty standard across all airlines. In the toothbrush bag, unsurprisingly, you get a toothbrush and toothpaste. There's also a small mint in the bag as well for that all-important freshness, and a leaflet telling you why it's important to have good dental care. In the bow, you get earplugs, a mask, a pair of socks, and those ear pad things that go over the headphones. Now, the eye masks are a bit of a letdown. They look and feel like the ones you get in the economy, so nothing too special here. I think now is a good time to have a look at the IFE screen. However, before we do, one minor thing I noticed was that when you set the chair into lounge mode, you actually sit higher than the screen. The reason I say this is that I would like to have shown you how the seat controls work, but I could never get it working. In some ways, I like how the Germans do it. They're pretty honest with things and they'll tell you exactly what you're watching. In other ways, I don't get it. Like, you know the chair is at an angle, but then the screen is against the wall, so you're never parallel to the screen, always watching slightly off center with your head slightly turned. But then instead of allowing you to shift the TV so it's in front of you, they allow you to rotate the TV away from your direct field of view. Now I'm guessing this is because if you want to share your screen with your neighbor, you can tilt it, but oh my god, the viewing angles are absolute trash. And I can't tell if this is a really old panel or anti-glare. But with that said, the seats behind the first row don't rotate. They just slide out, which fixes the problem of the viewing angle. So why they made the first row different, I don't know. Additionally, the remote was a miss for me. Like the nipple was a good idea on paper, but never executed properly. What I mean by this is that you can only control the screen with the black square in the middle, which moves a pointer on the screen. There's no arrow keys on the side to control the remote, and the D-pad on the back doesn't work either. So you're left using this not so user friendly input device. Not to mention the fact that it's super sensitive, the gentlest nudge will trigger the menu bar. Anyway, in the menu section, entertainment is split by type, which makes things super simple. In the movie section, there were some recent hits, notably Mulan and Joker being the most recent blockbusters. There are also some good Hollywood choices out there as well, which is nice to see. Categories wise, the carrier splits them into groups like you would expect, like action, thrillers, comedies, and artistic. What's more, there's also the function to filter movies by spoken language, which is a nice touch. TV shows wise, they have a broad range and there's a sampling for everyone, especially if you're into documentaries, crime and sitcoms. But the carrier falls into the trap of offering a few shows in the middle of seasons. So if you want to sample a show, say the first episode to see if you like it, then unfortunately you won't be in luck. For the music, I didn't know anyone there, but that would be because of my music preferences. What I would say is don't expect to find any A-list musicians there, but I suspect if you're into the indie scene, then you may actually find it quite enjoyable. What's more, audiobooks aren't that well stocked, 
But if you want something to read, what I would say is have a look at the top story section as you may find an article of interest to you or head over to Lufthansa World as that's where the in-flight magazines are kept. In addition, there's also a kids section, which is just the family sections of the TV, movies and music section. Onboard well-being is available if you want to do a bit of guided stretching. In terms of other buttons, the home button takes you to a somewhat redundant homepage that advertises Wi-Fi. Additionally, there's a button that leads to a personalized experience screen which displays a QR code. However, I couldn't get it to work. It doesn't tell you what app you need to make it work, and I tried using the Lufthansa app which didn't do anything. I'd be really interested to know what it does, so if you do know, please leave a comment down below. Moving on, the world map counterintuitively doesn't show you a route map, instead it's there to change the language. The in-flight map is actually accessible by clicking on the button showing the remaining time of your flight. It's quite inflexible, so don't expect too much from it. But this leads us on to the audio. Lufthansa has opted to use the AKG N60 since they were launched. At the time of recording, they're about 120 euros per headphone. The pros of these headphones are that they feature active noise cancelling and overall look fairly nondescript. It's made of plastic mostly and doesn't have the best seal. If you are sensitive to it, you may notice a bit of distortion in the lows and mids due to the ANC. The bass is a bit boomy, but otherwise not overemphasized. Mids and vocals are treated fairly well with minimal distortion due to the ANC unit. That said, as you'll most likely be watching movies and TV shows in flight, I'd actually say that the AKGs are better than the MH50s because the audio is just a bit more pronounced and vocals are clearer. If that made no sense to you, what I'm trying to say is that the headphones are actually quite good for what they are. So with the main bulk of the review done, it was hitting 4am and it was time to get some sleep and that meant rolling out the topper and the blanket. Well, as you can see, someone before me had a really restful sleep. And what are these stains? So I hopped over to the next seat across, and as you can see, the bedding rolled out as you would expect. I will say that if you are of a larger build, you won't find the seat as enjoyable to sleep in, as you may find it a bit tight to be in. For reference, I would say the seat is slightly narrower than the Colin Super Diamond seat. I think back sleepers too will find it somewhat annoying. Lying on your back, one arm is bent at the elbow, as the alcove where the USB charger is isn't long enough, and on the other side, with nothing for your arm to press up against, just naturally rolls off with your hand basically touching the floor so side sleeping is probably the only way. With the sleep over, breakfast again was nothing special. I think the main bulk of it is the same breakfast as an economy, the eggs were rubbery and the potatoes really mushy. The volume of food though, that's a completely different story. Lufthansa gives you a lot of food. On this flight I had to tap out. The portion sizes were large for in-flight meals and I only got through the fruit and the eggs before conceding defeat. What I did notice is that unlike many other carriers, Lufthansa will only give you the exact pieces of cutlery that you need in the napkin roll. With breakfast out of the way, I had a bit more time, so I decided to have a look at the onboard Wi-Fi. So what I found was getting on was pretty simple. Jumping onto Telecom Flynet and you should be taken to the landing page automatically. Just like Cathay though, if it doesn't take you there, jumping onto Lufthansa.com will work, but as you can see, if the page hasn't cached, then you're in for some pretty long load times. Anyway, I gave up waiting and sometimes it's just easier to ask the crew. But when you finally get onto it, navigate your way through the pages and you'll finally get to the option screen with three options to choose from. Starting from 7 euros for the entire flight for chat isn't bad, but the top plan for 29 euros is actually quite pricey for only 1 gig of data. That said, considering the age of the aircraft and taking into account Lufthansa was the first to debut onboard Wi-Fi, I'm going to guess that the onboard system uses the older generation Q-band system, which I believe has bandwidth limitations as the newer systems allow for Netflix streaming while in flight. Now there seems to be progress for a newer generation, because if you backtrack a bit and go through a different part of the landing page, you can see that for long haul aircraft, you get slightly different pricing. As you can see, this time you're capped against time as opposed to being limited by the amount of data you can use. So as we begin to land, I think it's a good time to summarize my thoughts on the flight. My views are that the seat isn't the best in the world, the dated and in a triple two configuration is pretty much less than desirable. The only redeeming features of the seat are that the tray table is functionally better than most other carriers, and there's a decent pair of headphones to accompany your IFE experience. Surprisingly though, as a 5 star carrier, the food is the weakest part of the service, which is pretty much in contrast to Cathay where they pretty much excelled at it. The food wasn't memorable and the menu wasn't exciting. Yeah, let's call it exciting. Like chicken with Chinese sauce and rice, I, I pretty much could have made that at home. The amenity kit was good, save for the eye mask, and the in-flight entertainment was broad ranging. The bathroom was clean but tired, however, for a 20 year old aircraft, I mean it will feel like it in there. But the best, and after this experience, probably the only reason why I would consider flying Lufthansa again, was because of the excellent service that I had on board. I didn't talk about it very much because I don't really want to start filming cabin crew, 
but there is nothing they could have done better for me to have a more enjoyable trip. I think on this flight they may have nudged out SQ as providing the best service I've ever had, but if not they came very close to it. The crew had personality, they smiled, they seemed interested, and had warmth to them. They were exceptionally attentive, going as far as asking me if I was comfortable on my seat, which was a first. And when my seat broke down at one point, they really tried getting it to work again, because even though there were 25 other seats available on the flight, they made a conscious effort to make it feel like that seat was my own. So all in all, it was a perfect 10 out of 10 service. Surprisingly for me, after I tallied up the numbers, they came out as strong as Cathay Pacific, but it's clearly evident without the high level of service of the cabin crew, they wouldn't have done as well. All in all, after this experience, I'd be really interested to try the new product, because with a new seat, better food, and this level of service, you really have a compelling product to be loyal to. And that's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. If you want, check out my Cathay Pacific review down below in their A350.